Hi, today we'll be talking about sourcing and supply management. Apple designs its devices in California, and this fact is proudly advertised uh, in small print at the back of their, for example, iPhones. Interestingly, Apple does not assemble its devices. Typically, these devices are assembled by Foxconn in China. So this begs the question, why doesn't Apple assemble iPhones? Well, the reason this is, is because Apple is aware that it is good at certain things, but not really good at others. So Apple does not want to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. This phrase refers to a person who dabbles in many different things, but unfortunately is not very good at any one thing. Apple is very clear about what activities it wants to perform in-house. Apple focuses on its core competencies, which are defined as a combination of multiple resources and skills that distinguish a firm in a marketplace. So Apple is aware that its core competencies include, for example, the integration of hardware and software in the, des in the design of user interfaces that are easy for people to use. It also includes chip design. So, for example, in the new iPhone 10s, 10R, and 10s Max, one, the new, they use the software on a chip which is known as the A12 Bionic, which was designed by Apple. Apple also is good at delivering a superior retail experience for customers, so the Apple stores are all run by Apple. However, for other things that Apple is not so good at, Apple relies on numerous suppliers. Uh, this, was, this shows some of the suppliers that Apple used for the iPhone 5S and 5C, but the same thing is true for the iPhone, the newest iPhones this year as well. Many of the components come from different suppliers across the world. All right, so uh, a company needs to answer the following questions when it thinks about the activities that it needs to perform. Should we perform this activity by ourselves or should we rely on a supplier? When we rely on a supplier, there are certain risks that our supplier may fail us, so how do we mitigate these supply chain risks? And finally, what sort of relationships should we have with our suppliers? So, the first, uh, let's go to the first uh, subsection of this lecture about insourcing versus outsourcing. Insourcing refers to performing a business activity in-house whereas outsourcing refers to relying on the, an external supplier. For example, when you own a car and you drive yourself around, that's insourcing because you are performing this action yourself. However, you could instead choose to hail a taxi or an Uber. And that would be outsourcing, relying on an external party to supply your transportation needs. Sometimes people refer to this as the make or buy decision, which means whether you insource or outsource the production of parts and components. I wanted to also mention there's another term called offshoring, which, is, which sometimes is confused with outsourcing. Offshoring means moving work from one country to another country, typically because labor costs are cheaper in the other country. For example, if Dell moves its customer service center from America to India, then to serve American clients, this would be called offshoring. So outsourcing has certain advantages. It can be cheaper uh, because the supplier may have economies of scale. For example, Foxconn assembles electronics for many, many different companies, basically the world's largest companies, electronics companies. So Foxconn has better economies of scale than Apple in electronics assembly. 
It also requires less capital investments to do outsourcing because you don't have to own the factories, you just pay for the services that you need. And you also can have flexibility in terms of scaling your capacity up or down. However, there are risks when you depend on suppliers for key products or services. And you also may lose the ability to control the process because those are not your employees, those are done by an external party. Uh, furthermore, you may also lose the ability to differentiate your products or service that you provide because everyone gets, if everyone uses the same supplier, it's hard for you to deliver something different because everyone has access to the same supplier. Here are some factors that drive outsourcing. So if an activity is not consistent with the company's current business focus, you want to outsource it. If that activity is not exclusive to the company, you want to outsource it. If the company does not have expertise in that area and other companies can perform the activity better, you also want to outsource that activity. And uh, let's look at now at the risk of outsourcing. All right, so when you have an important supplier, there's a risk that this supplier will let you down. Don't let me down. Uh, ow. And of course, that's bad when your supplier lets you down. Let's discuss the example of Nokia and Ericsson and their supplier Philips. So in the 1990s and early 2000s, Nokia and Ericsson were two of the world's largest cell phone manufacturers. A key component of making a cell phone is a radio frequency chip. What was interesting was that these two rival companies were both supplied by a Philips semiconductor factory in Albuquerque. Unfortunately, one day lightning struck uh, around the area and caused a fire in the Albuquerque factory. So let's see how Nokia and Ericsson handled the situation. The staff at Nokia were very scared and took great care to investigate the situation. Uh, whereas at Ericsson, they were more relaxed and they thought that, okay, there might be a delay in the chips coming to our factory due to the fire, but we trust Philips to get things done. When Nokia sent their staff to investigate, they found out the fire was much more serious than, Eric's, than Philips had told them, so they found alternative sources of chips immediately and locked them in. On the other hand, Ericsson was sole sourcing with Philips, and because they were too relaxed about the situation, they did not find out how serious it was until it was too late to get alternative sources of chips. Due to this, Ericsson was unable to produce a lot of phones that it wanted to produce and sell, and Nokia used this opportunity to gain significant market share. Ericsson lost a lot of money and was forced to merge with Sony in order to survive. And that's why after this debacle, there was a new kind of cell phone brand called Sony Ericsson. So this example shows you how risky it can be to rely on a supplier and when the supplier lets you down. Let's now talk about supplier relationships. So when you have a relationship with your supplier, it could range from very transaction-oriented to very collaborative. So transaction-oriented relationships about are focused on maintaining independence from each other, whereas collaborative relationships focus on mutual dependence. Transaction-oriented relationships focus on the price, whereas collaborative relationships focus on the total cost of operation of both the supplier and the customer. Transaction-oriented relationships tend to be short-term, whereas collaborative relationships are focused on building long-term partnerships. Finally, in a transaction-oriented relationship, companies want to keep their own information private, whereas in a collaborative relationship, companies are willing to share information with each other in order to help uh, both of them operate more efficiently together. Let's look at Tesla as an example. 
Uh, Tesla is a manufacturer of electric cars. Should Tesla have a strong relationship with its battery supplier? The answer is yes, because batteries are a very important component and a very expensive component of making an electric car. Should Tesla have a strong relationship with its stationary supplier? Well, not really, because stationary is a commodity and many, many companies can provide good enough stationary at a reasonable price. So it makes sense for Tesla to have a collaborative relationship with its battery supplier, but a transaction-oriented relationship with its stationary supplier. Uh, one of the interesting differences between U.S. automakers and Japanese automakers is that traditionally, U.S. automakers have had a very transaction-oriented relation, transaction -oriented relationship with their suppliers. So, for example, one uh, supplier describes the U.S. automakers as something like terrorists who force them to reduce their costs and uh, drive very hard negotiations with them. On the other hand, the Toyota, which is one of the Japanese automakers, is willing to invest in the supplier to help them to improve their production systems and to grow their business with them. So that this is the collaborative relationship that the Japanese automakers have with their suppliers is one reason why Japanese auto, automobiles are higher quality and lower cost than American automobiles. All right, so we've talked about supplier relationships. Uh, this is also related to supply chain risk. So your, a company wants to increase the supply chain resilience and reduce supply chain risk, and there are many ways that you can do so. The key uh, method that I want to... Uh, you can read these here, like higher, holding higher infantry levels, uh, building strategic partnerships, communicating and monitoring your suppliers. Um, also, a useful idea is to have more than one supplier for critical materials that you need. I'm going to talk more about the strategic partnership uh, and the having more than one supplier in a bit. So Emirates is an airline company uh, that invested heavily in the Airbus A380. It in fact owns more than a hundred of these super aircraft and it spent a lot of money renovating the Dubai airport to accommodate this very very large aircraft. Unfortunately for Emirates and Airbus, the A380 has relative has quite poor sales. So Airbus threatened to terminate the A380 program if their biggest and perhaps only customer Emirates did not order more aircraft. Because Emirates was depending upon Airbus for this, their existing A380s and they need, you know, continue to need new parts to continue to operate them for many years to come, Emirates was forced to buy 36 more A380s at a list price of more than $16 billion. A second example is Panasonic and Tesla. So, as mentioned earlier, Tesla builds electric cars and one of the key components they need are batteries to power those cars. Panasonic is one of the companies that makes is the best in the world at making batteries. So Panasonic and Tesla agreed to construct a big battery manufacturing plant together in somewhere in Nevada in the United States and uh, Tesla will provide a lot of the land building utilities Panasonic will provide the manufacturing equipment and so on. So by working together, Tesla is assured of a steady supply of batteries at a lower cost since the facilities are basically located together next to Tesla's factories. And Tesla, uh, Panasonic gains a steady demand from a customer. So basically this is a win-win partnership for both parties. Alright, so that's all for today's video lecture. See you in class.